Today's video was recorded on October 18th, 2022, and in today's lesson, we are going to look at the concept of covenant. So in our modern context, the use of covenant has generally fallen away, except for perhaps in some legal arenas, and we've generally lost what the significance is of the biblical covenant. So in biblical times, covenants were everywhere, and God uses this concept to help the Israelites understand the type of God that he is and the nature of the relationship that they're entering. God is a God who covenants, and it's very important for us to understand that. In fact, our Bible is comprised of a series of covenants, the latest one being the New Covenant, or as we say, the New Testament. So we are in a covenant relationship with God through Jesus. So in this lesson, we look at covenant and how Exodus is structured just like other covenants found in the ancient Near East. The topic of covenant is of such significance to our understanding of God. I think that once you spend some time familiarizing yourself with them, that you'll see how it helps deepen our conceptions of God and how we relate to him. Fig Tree Ministries is a 501c3 nonprofit, and we're supported through the amazing generosity of our donors. And if you've found our lessons valuable in your study of the Bible, we ask that you would consider making a financial donation to support the ministry. Your financial support directly impacts our ability to continue to expand our reach and help others just like you go deeper into the biblical text. Because the clearer we understand scripture, the deeper we can go into the text, the more solid the foundations of our faith become. So support for our ministry is easy and secure through our donation link on our website, bigtreeteaching.com. And we've also included a link that'll take you directly to the donation page in the description section below. For all of our supporters, we give a big hazak hazak vanit hazak, which translates be strong, be strong, and together we'll be strengthened. Thank you again for all your amazing support. We hope you enjoy this lesson on Exodus as a covenant and what it means that we're in covenant relationship with God. Okay, so for, for many of you on this study tonight, we've done this. We did a whole series. So in fact, I'll, for, for anybody watching on the video, we do have uh, in our YouTube videos, we have a whole series on covenant because tonight is just going to be a brief overview of covenant, but you can take it much deeper. And so it's a four-part series on covenant. And it really helps you understand so much of the imagery of what's happening in the New Testament. We'll hit a little bit of that tonight. But the topic's going to be covenant. God is coming down on Mount Sinai in the book of Exodus, and he establishes a covenant. So then we have to say, well, what does that mean? What is a covenant relationship? And then how do scholars know that what's happening on that... Um, mountain or what's happening in Exodus is a covenant. Where do, how would we know that? Well, covenants are found all over the ancient world. And so one of the handouts that I gave you is the structure, and we'll go over it tonight, of an ancient covenant. And lo and behold, that's the mechanism that God uses to say, okay, here's how we're going to create a relationship. So the covenant uh, is from the culture God uses it and says, now we're in a covenant relationship. And of course, we are part of the new covenant, even though we say testament. So this is going to be our 25th in the book of Exodus. Uh, the painting in the background, Rembrandt, uh, Moses smashing the stone tablets from 1659. So that'll represent the tablets of the covenant law. And again, the main idea is, what is covenant? God is, is a God who covenants or wants to covenant with us. He's not just an unrelatable force that you worship to gain whatever power in the world, right? To, to fend off the chaos of the world. He's not just a force that we're out to get more of. He's a relational God, and covenant is all about 
relationship. As I just mentioned, the first, well, 80% of our Bible is an Old Covenant, what we call the Old Testament. And then, of course, the newest covenant, or the, the latest one in a series of covenants in the Old Testament, that's our Christian covenant and what governs our relationship to God through Christ and governs our Christian walk. Um, and then what does that mean? So that's going to be kind of the main topic tonight. Since we have kind of lost the idea of covenant with the exception of perhaps marriage and some legal terms, we'll talk about what this is. This is what we're going to explore. All right, so the first thing I want to do then is start with a definition. So number one on your handout. Um, as I mentioned, covenants are found throughout the ancient Near East. And so when we look at the, the elements that are inside of an ancient Near East covenant, because all of the neighbors of Israel are around uh, that area, from the Hittites to the Assyrians to the Babylonians, they all use ancient covenants. So then we have to go back and say, okay, let's, let's start with a definition of covenant because this is going to help us understand what God is up to. So on your handout, um, the definition of covenant is an agreement between two parties, okay? An agreement between two parties in which one or both make promises under an oath to perform or refrain from certain actions stipulated in advance. And so there's some important pieces to that, right? It's an agreement between two parties. God doesn't force the covenant upon us. We agree to the covenant. We accept his offer of the covenant. Just like last week or the week before, the Israelites said, we will do, we will obey. They heard the covenant and said, we'll do it. So it's between two parties. There's an oath involved. I'll cover that um, later. But it's, there's promises. Right? Both parties make God makes promises to us. We make promises to God then. There's certain actions that we do, and there's certain actions that we don't do. And we are obligated to those in our covenant relationship with God. And then the cool thing is, is it's all stipulated in advance. God doesn't surprise us with things. He gives us the covenant in advance. We can look at it, we can study it. We can be aware of the covenant. Sometimes we're not aware that we're going off the path, but we have mechanisms that get us back onto the path. So it's all stipulated in advance. This covers covenant from all over, right? These are the covenants that happen between kings and vassals, but it's the same thing that happens with God. Same type of thing. Now, the definition, um, I didn't put this on your hand up. This is called the Anchor Bible Dictionary. And this is volume one of six. So it only, it's, it's a dictionary of biblical topics, and this one only covers A through C. And if you could see the side view of it, that's a thick book. This is a, hu a huge volume as, an, uh, a, as a Bible dictionary. I don't recommend, if you're not really serious about wanting to learn all this stuff, it's expensive. There's six volumes. But this is where that definition comes from. And if you're really looking to have a resource that can take you into any topic you can find in the Bible, the Anchor Bible Dictionary is a great resource. That's where this definition comes from, under C, covenant. So, okay, what's important about a covenant? Well, it creates a relationship. It actually creates and governs a relationship. So. Again, God wants to covenant with us. Ah, as soon as you hear that word covenant, we're in a relationship. That's what makes God so awesome. So it creates relationships, and we're going to look at a word called uh, a fictive kinship. So fictive, well, one, we'll look at a word. No, we're going to look at two words. Fictive kinship. So a fictive kinship is the idea of creating relationships through a legal mechanism. Here's what it says. 
It's a legal mechanism or devices by which outsiders, so non-kin, would be incorporated into a kinship group. So you have a covenant, and then what covenant does is it creates fictive kinship, meaning we're not necessarily related, but suddenly we become a family. And there you get the metaphor of God as Father, and we are children of God. And we can be adopted or brought into that fictive kinship through legal mechanism. So outsiders can come into a group that is normally there. And you can see the moment you create that covenant, now you've got a relationship that wasn't necessarily there to begin with. Okay, so that's what covenant does, is create that kinship. Okay, two uh, examples. So on your sheet I have down there, two examples of fictive kinship are marriage and adoption. So that's what even in our world today, you can think of both marriage and an adoption are legal mechanisms. And when you go through either one of those processes, you have a relationship where one didn't exist before. And then what we find is that both of these metaphors are used in the Bible to help us understand our relationship to God. So again, one of the things that the rabbis say is that God speaks in cultural language. So he, he, he's going to present everything through something that we are, that we can say, ah, I understand, because God is so different than us. You know, your ways are not my ways, says the Lord, that God uses concrete metaphors for us to say, I understand now my relationship to God. So marriage and adoption. So for instance, if we just look at marriage, the idea of marriage, well, marriage does two things, right? It's both a covenant and a fictive kinship. When we get married, when you go to a wedding, you, what you're watching is a wedding covenant take place. And so you stand there, and when you're married, there's stipulations and there's obligations and you have different expectations of the individuals now that you're inside that relationship. That's, of course, what that is, right? We say that you'll be faithful in sickness and health and for rich or for poor and good times and bad. And I promise that I'll be there for you. And we're saying all of this as a covenant, right? We even have witnesses at a wedding. And many of you have been in weddings as that witness, right? And if the the marriage should go awry, then you should be able to call on those witnesses and say, didn't you hear Scott say, you know, that he would do this and do that? And they would all say, yeah, we did. We're the witnesses to that. And it, of course, strengthens the bond. And we're going to see all of this. A marriage covenant. All the same things that we see in a, in a wedding or our marriage is what we see with God. And that's exactly why the event at Mount Sinai is depicted as a wedding and God is the bridegroom. The other one, it's also a fictive kinship, right? So two families are coming together. So you have two families that were apart, and now they're connected. And so then you get father-in-law and mother-in-law, because the law says you're now connected. So it creates that fictive kinship. It brings people together. So marriage is a great example, and obviously it's the primary metaphor in the Bible for our relationship to God. So, for instance, and I, let me see if I, I think I used one that I did not put on your sheet, but if you want to, turn to Isaiah, if you have your Bible, Isaiah 54, 5. You can turn there. So, Isaiah says, for your maker is your husband. The Lord Almighty is his name. The Holy One of Israel is your Redeemer. He is called the God of all the earth. But you can see there, now I'm just giving you one example of many. Your maker is your husband. Exodus is seen as the marriage, the, the coming together. The Bible talks about as soon as you're in the marriage, what do they do? They worship a false god. That's cheating on their husband. You get the book of Hosea, which is a, an example of Israel's relationship to God. And he has to marry a prostitute, and then the prostitute's unfaithful but God redeems them anyway. So it's showing you the love of God for his people, just like a husband. So 
just an example of where you find that in the Bible. But let me ask you this. What about adoption? Where do we find an example of adoption? Well, we find it in... Oh, by the way, let me go backwards. The Old Testament, God is the groom, Israel's the bride. What's our New Testament metaphor? Christ is the bridegroom. The church is the bride. And so you have examples both in Ephesians and in Revelation that one day the two will come together. The, the, the bridegroom will come to get his bride, just like the, it mimics a wedding in Israel where there's a period of time where the, the bride has to wait for the bridegroom because the bridegroom is preparing a place for you at the Father's house. That's Jesus' Jesus's words in John, I go to my Father's house to prepare a place for you. That's wedding language. Ah, and we're all waiting for the day that we can then be reunited, the church with Christ, in the place that he's prepared for us. So the, the metaphor runs throughout both the Old and the New Testament. That's my point of just bringing that up. Okay, but adoption. We have, this, we have adoption as one as well, and Paul uses it. And if you have your Bible, again, you can turn to Ephesians 1.5. And this is really an interesting one. So Ephesians 1.5, there's something interesting going on, and I think it fits really the, the Ephesians, perhaps even more than some of the other churches. So Ephesians 1.5, it says that God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family, bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. This is what he wanted to do and it gave him great pleasure. Now, that's from the New Living Translation. But notice, he wanted to adopt us. And adoption, as we mentioned, that's the fictive kinship, creating a relationship that wasn't there before. And so the question is, for these Ephesian Gentile believers, they're not even citizens of Rome, let alone citizens of Israel. And so the question is, how do I as somebody who's outside the covenant of, of Israel, God's covenant, how do I enter that covenant relationship? You know, or perhaps if you're Jewish living in Ephesus, you might have this question for Paul. You know, hey, Paul, how exactly is this working, right? How do the Gentiles get into that covenant relationship? And Paul's answer, of course, is he uses the metaphor of, of adoption. Yes, they're not inside the family, but now we're going to bring them inside the family. You are no longer foreigners and aliens. So you've been brought in under God's, to be part of God's covenant family. So we can see even adoption is used so that once you're adopted in, you get this, right? Because when, it, when two parents adopt a child, they have every legal responsibility towards that child. They have to take care of the child, they have to feed the child, they have to put the child in school, and they have to do all the things that any a normal parent would do once it's a legal adoption. That's what Paul's saying. Now that you're inside the family of God, you get all the blessings as well. So, this is what a covenant is. We enter into that covenant voluntarily, that agreement between two parties. It creates a relationship, like a marriage or an adoption. Once we're inside that relationship, though, when we are, just like in a marriage, there's oaths and there's promises, and you have to perform a refrain. And it's not about salvation, it's about maintaining the relationship. And so when we fail today, we have to, you know, if, if somebody was failing, a Christian was failing and, you know, doing something you know they shouldn't do, we would say to him, get your act together, get right with God, repent. And that's not repentance for salvation. It's repentance to turn back to God, to come back into the, the relationship. Okay, so that's the main thing. Now, let's go through, now that we have a definition, let's look at the elements of an ancient Near East covenant. Now, this is number two on your handout. And I have, um, so A-N-E on the screen there is ancient Near East. So they find these. 
everywhere. Uh, and really a great thing to study because you can see then how God takes what the culture does and then puts his own spin on it. And always in a way that's amazing. Um, I have on your sheet two words here. Uh, I said, I have on your sheet, suzerain vassal. Now, those are the scholars refer to these covenants as suzerain vassal. Those are not words that Jesus would have known or Moses would have known. A suzerain is the king. So generally speaking, two parties are coming together to create a covenant, and generally one of them is a greater party. And in this case, it's God. But in just the regular ancient Near East, it would have been a king. So you have a king, and they're coming together with a vassal subject to say, all right, let's now create a relationship where there wasn't one before. Obviously, you can see the king, that's another metaphor that's used in Exodus. They make God their king. And just like we say Jesus is Lord, so God is not only metaphorically a father, but he's metaphorically a husband, and he's metaphorically a king, and he's metaphorically a shepherd. And so all of those are, are there at one time. And, of course, Israel becomes the vassal state. So, let's go down the list here, and I have them. I'm just going to do them in order. Um, the, the first thing that every covenant has is some type of preamble. And the preamble has one thing that it's going to do, is it's going to name the covenant giver. And what's funny is to read some of these ancient Near Eastern preambles, how the king is just glorifying himself. King so and so of such and such is the most glorious of all human beings and the greatest king that's ever lived, and blah, 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 blah. And it's just on and on and on and on and on. And when we get to God, he just says, I am the Lord your God. Preamble. That's who I am. I'm the one creating this covenant. Okay. Next, you have what's called the historical prologue. So they're going to name who the covenant giver is and they're going to say, okay. Here's the history behind why you should obey this covenant. And so maybe the king said, look, I had a relationship with your father, and, you know, you, sh you should then enter this new covenant with me. Or it could be something like, uh, do you remember how we didn't kill you when we took over your land? And because of our mercy, you should enter this covenant. Because if you don't, guess what's waiting for you? We'll kill you. So it's kind of like, you know, forcing you into it, but usually it's a history. Why should you obey? Uh, every covenant, number three, has some kind of stipulations and obligations. What's expected out of each party? Usually, the king says, I'll provide you protection, but you are going to provide me tribute money, and you're going to provide me troops if I need it, if we're fighting off an enemy, and you're going to provide grain if I need it, but it's usually some kind of protection. I'll come to your aid if you need it. So it's uh, something like that from the king. Next one. Uh, where are we going to keep this covenant? Deposition. So it's going to be stated in the covenant where we're going to keep a copy of this. And generally speaking, the copy is going to be placed in the temple of whatever god is your God. So if you're making a covenant with the city of Ephesus, then a copy goes in the Artemis temple because she's going to protect the covenant. Okay, so it, you keep the covenant and then God protects it. And that gets kind of interesting with the Bible here. There's going to be something about a periodic reading. You have to know what's in the covenant. So we want you to periodically read it. There's a list of witnesses. Because if you fail in the covenant, we're going to call the witnesses to say, hey, did you see what that person did? They failed in the covenant. And usually, the witnesses are a pantheon of gods. All of the gods surrounding us, and maybe even some gods just to make sure that we got them all, that are going to come after you if you fail in this covenant. They're going to be the witnesses. And then finally, uh, the last one, number six, is curses and blessings. This is, if you keep my covenant, then I will bless you, and I'll bless you in your family, and I'll bless you in the field, and I'll bless you here, and I'll bless you there, and I'll bless you there. But if you don't keep my covenant, well, you're going to get run over by, you know, the enemy, and you'll be suffering here, and you'll be suffering there, and blah, blah, blah. So you get a whole idea of curses and blessings.
So that makes up the, the all of the elements of the ancient Near East covenant. And then, without a doubt, what you would have to add to that then is a covenant ratification ceremony. You're going to have something that's going to show we just ratified that covenant. Just like a treaty today cannot be enter, entered into by a president. It has to be ratified through a process in Congress and the states, however they do that. But you have to do this covenant ratification ceremony. And almost always, if not, if you could, if you could say always, but almost always, there is a sacrifice involved in which blood must be shed, and the blood represents what, you, basically what you're saying is, this blood rep represents what you can do to me if I fail in the covenant. So the blood is representing the penalty for failing in the covenant. That's how serious covenants are. And so you might say to yourself, ah, well, you know what? Sin, sin is a violation of the covenant right? That's what we call sin, is when you violate the covenant. And what's the penalty for sin? The penalty of sin is death. And that's the same thing. It's representing when you do, when you do that uh, covenant uh, sacrifice, that's what the blood represents, right? And at the end of the wedding, we say, till death do us part, meaning only death can break the bonds of this covenant. That's how serious it is, right? Maybe we should start introducing animals back into our wedding ceremonies to show how serious it is when you break that covenant. Maybe they would, maybe people wouldn't rush into marriages as people can do. So, okay, the second one is then a shared meal, and that's almost like the wedding reception, some kind of party. You're going to share a meal that brings everybody together. So I'm going to, sh I'll show you where that is in Exodus as well. Okay, now, let's move on then. Let's go to Exodus, and I want to... This is, the, this is what I sent out last night that I forgot to attach. So it's a third page, and it takes the sections of the ancient Near East Covenant on, on the left side, and then we're going to say, what does this look like that we find in Exodus or even in Deuteronomy? Because it really, the whole Torah becomes covenant, but... We'll look at it in Exodus. And then at the bottom of that page, I reference a book, and it's this book right here. Sandra Richter, uh, Dr. Sandra Richter, she teaches Old Testament. And the last I recall, she was. Oh my, now I'm. Now I can't remember. Oh, Westmont. Thank you, Westmont. Uh, anyways. If you're interested in learning about the Old Testament, this book by Sandra Richter is amazing. This book, I've seen people, their lives change when they finally realize the importance of understanding the Old Testament. It's a great book, easy to read. She's a great teacher. Everything about it. I cannot recommend this book enough because it really, her whole goal is to help you put the Old Testament in order. Okay, let me go back here. Okay, so here's what we're going to do. Then we go to Exodus, and we say, well, let's take these elements and line them up with the Bible. And as I mentioned, the preamble, right? Instead of this long, flowery preamble of what an amazing king you are, God just says, I am the Lord your God. That's the preamble. I'm the covenant giver. Okay, what's the historical prologue, God? What happened? Well, it's in the same verse. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. Why should I obey this covenant? Because I delivered you. That's why. Why do we obey Jesus? It's not earning anything anymore, yet we're obedient. We do because we're, we're thankful for, for having been delivered. We're grateful for the relationship that we're in. So we, we do it out of, out of thankfulness, and it's the, it, it's the loyalty of a covenant. So, historical prologue. I, I saved you. I brought you out of the land of Egypt. Then you get number three, stipulations and obligations. Well, we have a whole bunch there in Exodus. Not only the Ten Commandments, but you get the, the chapters that we looked at 
21 and 23 called the Book of the Covenant, about how do we structure society for the presence of God to dwell. And inside there, you have stipulations and obligations, right? You shall do this. You shall not do that. Okay? Then we get number four, deposition. Normally, you deposit the covenant. Each party gets a copy of the covenant. You deposit it in whatever god of your city or, or country. But now, where are we going to deposit it? Well, you deposit it in the place where God dwells. You deposit it in the tabernacle, in the Ark of the Covenant. So God is not only the covenant giver, but he's the God who's going to protect that covenant once it's in the Ark of the Covenant, which is the whole point of the movie, right? The, the Raiders of the Lost Ark. What was in there and what happens when you open that covenant? Okay, periodic reading. Well, first of all, Moses, what we looked at two weeks ago, is Exodus 24. Moses reads aloud the covenant, and all the people say, yes, we will do, we will obey. Now, we do find later in the Bible, it says every seven years, bring the Torah out, read it again, allow people to hear the words of the covenant, make sure they don't forget. So there's a periodic reading that happens. List of witnesses. This is my favorite one, because who can be witnesses for God? Who can stand outside and be witnesses for God? Well, God says, uh, heaven and earth. I call heaven and earth as witnesses. That's what God says in Deuteronomy. So the list of witnesses, I call heaven and earth today. And what's so cool is the very first, well, it's, it's verse 2 in Isaiah, and it's on your sheet. When Isaiah is about to point out to Israel that they're failing, who does he address first? The witnesses. Hear, you heavens, listen, earth. And then here's what God says Israel violated the covenant. So the first thing the prophets do are call on the witnesses. And it's just cool. The God who created the heavens and the earth, that's the only the only witnesses he can call, you know, versus humanity. And then, of course, we'll finish this, curses and blessings. So Deuteronomy 28, that's the big chapter in Deuteronomy. If you go, if if you obey the covenant, this, 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 this will be all your blessings. But if you don't, well, the enemy is going to overwhelm you and he's going to take you in your city and your your crops are going to fail and blah, 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 and all that. So you have the same thing. And if you can understand the, the blessings and the curses in Deuteronomy, you can understand so many things happening in the New Testament and how they view that. It's really, it's very helpful. Okay, these two I do want to look at. Where's the covenant ratif- uh, ratification ceremony? And where then is the shared meal? So uh, if you would turn to Exodus 24, because they're both in Exodus 24, they're only a couple verses apart. So Exodus 24, verse 8. Now this is uh, verse 7 we looked at two weeks ago. Moses read aloud all the words that God had given him. The people responded, we will do, we will obey. So they just accepted the words of the covenant. And then you say, okay, well, if you accepted the words of the covenant, what do we need to do? We need to ratify it with a sacrifice. And that's exactly what happens in the book of Exodus. So, or in verse 8 here, Moses then has the sacrifice, and it says, Moses then took the blood, sprinkled it on the people, and says, This is the blood of the covenant that the Lord has made with you, in accordance with all of these words. Now, they understand the symbolism of the blood. They get it, because that's an ancient thing. We sometimes don't quite understand what that blood represents. But what's really cool about this, with our New Testament covenant, is that when Jesus, it's Matthew, and I put down the wrong verse down there, it's Matthew 26, 26, but when Jesus is at the Last Supper, and he then says, the wine, this wine here, 
is my blood of the new covenant. So he's quoting, or at least paraphrasing, Moses. And so what's the What's the sacrifice for the new covenant? What's the covenant, the ratification sacrifice? It's Jesus. It's his blood. And when you're covered, just like Moses sprinkled the blood on the people, when you're covered in the blood of Jesus, you're now inside that new covenant. Relationship with God. Your sins have been forgiven from the past. So this is a powerful moment that Jesus is, is going to end up recreating. All right, so that's the covenant ratification ceremony. And then if you would look down uh, just two verses to the shared meal, that's where I want to go next. If you look at verse 11 in Exodus 24, there's kind of a strange thing going on here. Moses calls the elders up onto the mountain. It says that they went up onto the mountain. They could see the heavens above. And then it says, but God did not raise his hand against these leaders, the leaders of the Israelites. They saw God and they ate and they drank. And that right there is now symbolizing that shared meal because they went up to God and now they're sharing a meal with God. So interesting uh, event that happened there right after you ratify the covenant. Okay, so you can see. I think, and if you have, a, have some time, go through some of these other verses that I have on here, but you can see how God uses this structure. They know exactly what that structure is. We're the ones who are confused. But once you know, it's like, oh, now I see what God is doing. And we're, we're going to enter into a similar relationship, obviously, through the blood of Jesus. That's what that represents now for the entire church. So really a great study, covenants, to help you understand so much of what's going on in the Bible and why things are happening the way they're happening. Um, Okay, let's do the last thing. And this is, I have, unfortunately, on your sheet, I had two number threes. This should be number four. But I want to talk about, we've been talking about this idea of redemption is a two-step, at least a two-step process. And not only does God deliver them, but there has to be some participation. The transformation from below is what we looked at. God can deliver us, but we have to participate. Those covenant stipulations and obligations, when we do them, we transform. That's part of the process of redemption. So I have a little drawing, and just want to walk through this a little bit, because I think this is what's happening with us. Now, Israel might be a little bit different because they're God's people through the Abraham, Abrahamic covenant. But let's assume it's, let's assume it's us, right? We're outside of the covenant relationship. And God's going to deliver us in, right? We have, we generally would say, ah, I have an awareness of God. I have sins of the past, though, that I have to have forgiven. Before I can enter that relationship, the sins of the past have to be forgiven. Well, how do I do that? Well, I repent. Okay, okay, God, I'm going to stop doing whatever I'm doing, and I'm going to confess my sins. Maybe it's confess and repent. Either way, repent. Repent and confess. And when you do, you go over to the next step. That's that step of salvation. And now you're into. a redeemed or you're saved into the covenant relationship. And now that you're in a relationship, just like a a marriage, you've got some stipulations and obligations. Because God wants you to be faithful, just like you want God to be faithful. So these stipulations and obligations aren't just random. They're actually guided by the fact that you're in a relationship. These are the commandments we see in the Torah. This is why I think there's so much confusion over, you know, the way that we talk about it in the church as a whole, the church as a whole, doesn't help um, because we get into these arguments about legalism or or whatever. But the, the idea is 
they're inside the relationship. That's the stipulations and obligations. And we have the same kind of stuff. In fact, as I'll show you, Jesus raises the bar on us. It doesn't get easier. It gets harder. So now, what if you're inside the relationship and, oh, by the way, you sin? Right? We're, what happens with your present sins? Well, it's the same mechanism. In the Old Testament, God offers a mechanism. Repent. Confess your sin. Now, there's a, there's, in that day, there's sacrifices, but that system's gone, and now we have Jesus as the sacrifice. But the point is, God says, look, I know I'm in a relationship with flawed people, so I'm going to provide you with a mechanism so you can get back into relationship with me, because that's what I want. Now, hopefully, what happens whenever you fall off the path, that you learn out of it, you grow. That's part of the spiritual growth process. We stumble along, we flail about, we go back to God and say, God, I repent. I, you know, I wasn't aware that I was off the path. God says, great, now get up, dust yourself off, learn the lesson that needs to be learned, and go forth, right? And that's part of that maturing and growth process that we all go through uh, as Christians. That middle section is where Israel is with God, trying to bring down the presence of God. And that's where we're at today. Now, there will be a day, okay? There will be a day for everybody where we're going to go to the next step of redemption, which is the full consummation. We're finally going to, our bridegroom is going to come get us. That's the final point of redemption is the fullness, the consummation of the marriage. And that's when we move, obviously, to our heavenly abode that Jesus is preparing for us. At that point, redemption is fully complete. But we have to be just very careful about the fact of where, it, where is Israel during Exodus as they're moving through this process? Where are we in this process, right? So if I go back this way, and I place us back in the middle, and then you say, okay, well, here's where we are with Jesus, right? We've entered a covenant relationship with God through Jesus. And oh, by the way, Jesus is actually increasing the ethical standards. Well, think of what he says, right? You've heard it say this, but I say to you that. You've heard it say, don't commit adultery. I say, even looking at a woman lustfully. So he's moving it to a higher ethical standard. It doesn't make it easier. So this whole area right here, that's us. That's our Christian walk. And what Jesus is going to do is he's going to say, stop focusing on all these external stuff, the food you eat, the clothes you wear, the manner of worship. Do you have live music or is it just a choir? Did you have an organ? You know, all these things that we argue about. He want, what he wants you to do is focus on your character, focus on the character of God and transforming you, increasing your character so that your ethical behavior is is getting better. You're transforming in that. And when you fail, when your character isn't strong enough or isn't developed properly, well, then you repent. It's not a repentance of salvation. It's a repentance of getting back on track. And we learn from our mistakes. So we're in the same process as Israel is with Exodus. Okay, so our new covenant, number four on your sheet, even though it's number five here tonight, let's go through this real quick. When we get to the new covenant, it's a relationship with God through Jesus now. He's our, he's the covenant ratifier. Our religious obligation, then Jesus wants us to move the, the focus, focus on reflecting the character of God. And so it becomes more of our, you want to transform in that matter, and don't worry so much about the, all of the outside stuff. So Jesus actually makes it a higher ethical standard than what was before. When we fail, what do we do? We repent. We confess. Sometimes, you know, throughout Leviticus, most of the sacrifices are for unintentional sin. I didn't know I was sinning. And when you become aware of your sin, now you repent and you confess. So sometimes we don't even know we're sinning. And you just, you wake up one day and you go, oh my, I was going down the wrong path. And then all of this is because, as Paul tells us, hey, you need to transform into the image of your creator, that you're created in the image of God. 
transformed to be like God. So you take the character of God and start reflecting it into the world today. That is what our New Testament is telling us to do, and it's all inside that covenant relationship. So, we have our covenant, right? It's the agreement between two parties. God wants to covenant with us. God on one side. God has obligations too. He's just not going to fail in those obligations. We're the ones that have to worry about failing. But God says, I'll protect you. I'll save you. I'll deliver you in the, in the final judgment. So there's, he has obligations. We make promises under oath. And this is a very interesting one. Um, that covenant ratification ceremony that we celebrate as the Eucharist or the communion, Jesus holds up the wine and says, this wine is, represents my blood. And so what's happening is every time we do communion or the Eucharist, we're basically going through that covenant ratification ceremony again. And in the first century, the Latin word that is sacrament, in the Latin, it was, uh, it was basically soldiers taking an oath to Caesar. And so when we do communion, and we raise that cup to our lips. We're promising under oath, I will obey Jesus. It's not just, I'm communing with you. It's an oath that we're making, just like that covenant, covenant ratification ceremony. What do we have to do? Well, we have to perform certain things, or at least Jesus wants us to. And we have to refrain some, from certain things. And all of that is stipulated in advance. So that's how this whole idea of covenant fits in, not only to Exodus, what's happening, that's where it begins, but, well, actually it begins at Abraham, which is really, that, one's the, that one is a really good one, um, but goes all the way through to our New Testament and makes it, uh, it deepens our, it can deepen the way that we view our New Testament and the way that we're connected to God. Okay, so that is the idea of covenant. And hopefully that at least raises our awareness of the, of the book that we're reading, because we're reading a covenant book. And it's not just God's a despotic leader who demands things and forces you into stuff. Uh, it just makes the, I think, makes the, makes the, the Bible richer in the end.